Smith, you're really going to have to get into the books on those emergency procedures. This is the second time that you've almost blown it. Yes, sir, I know. I'll hit the books. You know, the regs require that I fail you right here, but I want to get you through the program. Good evening, sir. Parker, your crew's scheduled for rest now. What are you doing in here? None of us could sleep, sir. That flight last night threw us off. Well, you know you're scheduled out at 0100. We'll be there, sir. The syllabus calls for a, an instrument ride today, but we're going to get you started on your low-level step-down. I haven't had the ground training after the low-level step-down. Look, boss won't mind if we change things around a little bit. We need to get you mission qualified as soon as possible. Is there anything behind the actuator? No. The parts just aren't in there. All right. I'm going to sign it off. Close it up. And from now on, Hughes, keep a tighter rein on your tools. I love to fly. The job is very, very challenging. The seventh axe is an integral part of Tactical Air Command's heavy aircraft unit. I'm Colonel Steve Foster, the commander of the seventh airborne command and control squadron. The seventh axe primary mission is the command and control of tactical air resources in the air to ground war. basically are the link between the tactical air control center and the forward air controller who does the direct controlling of the aircraft. The seventh axe is also unique in the fact that it has several aircrew positions that don't exist in other aircraft. For example, in the back we have the director of airborne battle staff known as the DABS. The role of the DABS is basically just uh, a coordinator. We direct the battle staff and we have approximately 11 highly experienced people that work for us. It is very important to have a tactical background because most of our work is done with fighter aircraft and it is essential that we understand the pilot. We do not ever try to take away from the pilot. We're trying to make our forces more effective and their jobs safer. I have an immediate raise copy. This is Bangor authenticate Bravo Sierra. The intel section is unique in the fact that uh, it is one of those few opportunities for an intelligence officer and intelligence technician to actually apply their knowledge in an ongoing fluid battlefield situation. In this position, we can be deployed on a moment's notice to go anywhere in the world and respond to a crisis situation. It's been reported that the convoy moving down Highway 23 has reached the mobile command post. 
and I'm responsible for, for listening to intelligence data, which I then interpret, analyze, and use to nominate targets. Request target nomination and target number at this time. I pass that down to the operations section where they will take care of that particular target. Banger, banger, boomer, two, two, flight. Boomer, two, two, banger. I have your words, you're copy. I draw on Kate Lima, Delta. Whatever. Target, troops and open. Tanks, trucks, APCs. Primary responsibility is to ensure the air tasking order is accomplished. I track the strike aircraft, ensuring that uh, they meet their time on target. And it's considerably different, uh, mainly due to the fact we have no radar on board, and the primary job of a weapons controller is scope duty, usually. Ours is 100% communications. We are a communications platform. We have some of the most experienced radio operators in the Air Force and basically they make our job 100% easier. We have 108 enlisted people flying in the organization. Flying on the uh, Airborne Battlefield Command and Control Center is a unique experience, and on the course of a year's time, you might be gone 100, 120, 180 days a year. It's an experience that you can't pass up. Go ahead. Got, uh, coming up to, uh, to line Charlie. Air Force, and that is to get the bombs on target. combat was like hunting a lion only this time the lion can hunt you right back it's big game hunting to its absolute epitome i thought i would be very very fortunate just to know a few of the aces and all of a sudden i found myself involved pretty heavily in shooting down enemy aircraft and ended up at the period as the leading ace Too, we had a known enemy and there he was and uh, so we knew that that was an enemy that we had to go against and we had to become victorious but when you take off and you get into actual combat with another airplane you don't really think of it in terms that there's there are human beings in that machine so you don't really say well i'm going to kill a guy or he's going to kill me it's an object in the sky that's against you and you want to get rid of it and it's only in in very few circumstances when you actually are close enough so that you see and are exposed to that human being that it really becomes a situation where you're now involved in the emotion of having killed and harmed another human being the day i got shot down uh, we had been on a bomber escort mission and we had been released from escorting the bombers to pick targets of opportunity and we were heading toward Paris. I happened to look down at the ground and I saw the railroad started down to attack and came up behind it and of course fired and I was going so fast that uh, I overran it and I was shot down. 
everything that was happening to me from that point uh, looked like a, a, a grade Z movie that I didn't really want to be in. I didn't want to go to the theater in the first place. And I got involved with the French underground within about 24 hours. They structured a, a mission to pick me and three French spies up and fly us back into freedom. So I got orders transferring me back to the United States right away and couldn't stay on in combat. And uh, uh, came back home. Uh, I had heard that uh, there was a group headed up by a guy that a lot of us will recall a lot in my age group in the days of Terry and the Pirates, that famous comic strip during World War II, the hero was a guy named Flip Corkin, and he was actually an Air Force colonel named Phil Cochran. I asked if I could be assigned to that, and within a short period of time, of course, orders came through and I got assigned to the Air Commandos and found myself in the Pacific. I only shot down one Japanese aircraft. I only saw about three. Well, I had been in the Pentagon working for the Secretary of the Air Force when the Korean War started to, to reach its at height. I transferred to Korea and went into combat there. We were trying to establish the capabilities of the Sabre jet to drop bombs in, in North Korea. And if we could do this, then maybe we would attract the MiGs to come up and fight with us, and then we'd be able to get more MiGs. That was really the bottom. Who cares about bombs? The bottom line was, let's shoot down more MiGs. The pilots that we were up against were Russian. We knew that because we listened to their air ground, air-to-air -air communication. It was all in Russian. We were outnumbered tremendously, but we had such a success ratio that it was just incredible in the annals of warfare. We shot down 14 MiGs to every one F-86 we lost. If you could get next to a MiG, uh, you were pretty assured that you weren't going to have any trouble and you weren't going to get shot down. Of course, that sounds funny considering the fact that I was shot down, but I can use the weak excuse that I was shot down by ground fire, not by enemy aircraft. As I turned around, I looked down on the ground and I saw a truck going down the highway, and I thought, well, I'll just knock that truck off and have a big story to tell the guys when I get home in the bar tonight. I got hit by ground fire. The cockpit filled with smoke, I called on the radio and said, geez, the, the, the pitiful cry, you know, I've been hit. Of course, that was it. I was captured. And the thoughts that go through your mind is, God, what have I done today? I mean, dear God, why are you after me? I've been a good guy. As they began to question me, they came forth with an accusation that I had been conducting germ warfare against them. And they were charging me as an international criminal, war criminal. Each time I was taken back to my cell, uh, I'd try to reflect and try to figure out what was going on. And I could see that brainwashing thing that was happening to me. They were keeping me awake for long periods of time, constant interrogation, practically no sleep at all. And I couldn't concentrate on things, and I knew it. I knew my mind was slipping. I decided that they were going to get to me. I was going to do something that would be harmful to my country and to the free world and make a confession that I knew was false. And uh, so I decided to to commit suicide. And uh, I have a lot of warning for young people these days who want to commit suicide. If, you're, if they're going to try it, they shouldn't try it by slashing their wrists because it hurts. <laughs> There's no question about it. Anyway, I did that. I finally cut my wrist, and I had blood going pretty good. And of course, the guards came rushing in with flashlights, and they saw the blood and came around and got me. They laid off of me for about 10 days and fed me intravenously. And then at the end of 10 days, approximately, they said, okay, we're going to start again. I probably made about a 10-page confession, and in that, I put in all kinds of phony stuff so that anybody could tell that it was a phony confession and there had been coercion involved. And I had been living in solitary confinement the whole time, hadn't talked to an American or a, or a Caucasian at all for, for about 16 months. We were the last group of prisoners to be exchanged during the prisoner war exchange. I was met by the senior intelligence person of Fifth Air Force, whose first comment was, my God, bud, we didn't know you were alive. A handful of prisoners had to show cause why they should be retained in the military service. Several left, several uh, continued to stay on. And in my case, uh, I got orders to go to a special weapons course at Sandia, which is a big atomic energy nuclear war kind of thing, which was sort of an absolvement. They're sort of saying, you're OK. We're going to let you know some more secrets. 
I look back on the military service as my fondest days when I really enjoyed myself. I think the military service is the noble service because it has the highest form of integrity of any profession. We need integrity. I think I did the best I could do. I believe in America and I believe that it needs to be defended and, and I was willing to, to put my life on the line to make sure that democracy prevails and I would do it again tomorrow. This afternoon yet. Uh, I'm a little, little old now to pull nine G's but uh, still, if, if it's required, then I think we all, ought to, we all ought to take a look around us and say we got it made here in this country and we've got to preserve that for our young people. In the next issue of Air Force Now, over 25,000 college students are pursuing Air Force commissions through the Reserve Officer Training Corps. The University of Southern California is part of the plan. Air Force medical personnel must go through medical readiness training each year. Visit Wilfred Hall Medical Center and see combat readiness in the making. We live a day in the life of a Vietnam warrior, the F-105 Thunder Chief. All this and more coming soon in Air Force Now.